The Seven Sorrows of the Blessed Virgin Mary Twice during the year the Western Church commemorates the sorrows of the Blessed Virgin Mary, on the Friday in Passion Week and again on September 15th. The first is the older feast instituted at Cologne and elsewhere during the 15th century. It was then called the commemoration of the distress and sorrow of the Blessed Virgin Mary and had in view specifically Our Lady's sufferings during the Passion of her Divine Son. When the feast was extended to the whole Western Church in the year 1727 under the title of Seven Sorrows, the original reference of the Mass and office to the crucifixion was retained, and the commemoration is still called the Compassion of Our Lady in some calendars, those of the Benedictines and Dominicans, as it was in many places before the 18th century. In the Middle Ages, there was a popular devotion to the five joys of Mary, and this was soon complemented by another in honor of her five sorrows at the Passion. Later, these were fixed at seven and extended back from Calvary to embrace her whole life. The Servite friars, who from their beginning had a particular devotion to the sufferings of Mary, were in the year 1668 granted a feast for the third Sunday in September on which these seven sorrows should be commemorated. And this feast was also extended to the Western Church in the year 1814. Mary's great sorrows begin at the prediction of Simeon that a sword would transpierce her heart. Soon afterwards, she was obliged to flee with the newborn infant, already an object of a fatal search. She lost him in the temple for three inexpressibly painful days. She met him on the road to Calvary, and the sight indeed pierced her heart. She saw him die, heard his final cry, and witnessed the opening of his side with the effusion of his last drops of blood mingled with water. She received in her arms the inert body of the most beautiful of the sons of men. Finally, she was obliged to depose him in a tomb, leave him there, and return with her adopted son John to a deicidal Jerusalem. The Queen of Martyrs has never ceased to encourage her children on earth to bear their own crosses, which complement the passion of Christ. He suffered first the ordinary contradictions of life. For three years he was taunted and regarded as a menace by those who should have recognized him and his mission. He knew hunger, cold, and fatigue. He slept so heavily in a boat amid a tempest that we can only suppose he was exhausted. He knew what it was to be abandoned in need and to lose, to the empire of various passions, followers he had called his. Christ is our forerunner in all human sorrows and difficulties. Mary, as his mother, offered to God with him all the afflictions of his earthly life, and she continues to offer those of the church for its sanctification, for the souls in purgatory, and for the salvation of all souls. We cannot really understand the extent and intensity of the suffering of Our Lady, because we cannot understand the intensity of her love for Jesus, because her love increased her suffering. Nature and grace concurred to produce in Mary's heart profound impressions. Nothing is stronger by nature than the love a mother has for her son, and by grace the love one has for God.